Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversation each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you, and please join us every Monday evening at this time, as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed our last week's episode with Rose Styron, Philip Schultz, and Marilyn Nelson, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Birds Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Birds Books hosts reading by in conversation with Susan Minot, Kristen Valdez Quaid, and David Rednick. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, many of you have probably already discovered the chat to the right of your page. Please feel free to comment there throughout the evening. But if you have a question, where I'm going to go to look is the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of the page. The green link to this episode, the little call to action, says you can go straight to the Birds Books website where you can purchase the author's books while supporting the bookstore at Write America. Our first speaker is Susan Minot. Susan Minot is an award-winning novelist, short story writer, poet, playwright, and screenwriter. Her first novel, Monkeys, was published in a dozen countries and won the Prix Femina Etranger in France. Her novel, Evening, was a worldwide bestseller and became a major motion picture. Her latest work is Why I Don't Write and Other Stories, was released last year. She teaches at Stony Brook University and lives in New York City and on an island off the coast of Maine. Please welcome to the screen, Susan Minot. I'm trying to hear Susan. There you are. Thanks so much, Alice. And um, I'm so happy to be reading, not kind of here, but in the the ether kind of here with Kirsten and um, David. Um, as I said to David, it's hard to have him on and not feel that we should be discussing Ukraine. Hard not to think about that, at least part of our brains all the time. Um, so I thought about what I should read and I'm going to read from my uh, latest book, which is a collection of short stories. And it's a story called Why I Don't Write. Um, it's, it's really more of a meditation than a kind of um, conventional story, or it's, it's almost like a poem, or it's kind of like a grocery list of, of the things that keep us from being able in the in the story context it's from writing but you can really expand that to being able to concentrate or being able to get the things done maybe that you you would rather be doing um and i think in our you know social media phone driven world we have a lot of flotsam that sort of drifts by us in a way different than it did probably even 10 years ago. And so this, this story is a little bit about that. It's sort of all those things. What do you do all day? In the morning, there is the counter with the teapot and the bag of tea in the white cup, the milk from the carton in the fridge, the door, the chair, which chair, 
the paper, the notebook, which notebook, the folder, the letters on the screen, the emails asking, the computer keyboard, then it all stops. She handed me the paper. Here's the bad news, she said. It takes courage to be happy. The headlines, fingers point, denial spread, and fury rises. The puffin vanishes. Supreme Court nominee challenged. Syrian forces have conflicting reports. More garbage bags. Will be subject to late fees. Nobody's going to leave themselves too exposed right now, said the man on his phone. He paused at the corner and repeated, nobody is going to leave themselves too exposed right now. The keys have to be replaced. I haven't seen him in over 20 years. An hour ago, I felt calm. Now I am heartbroken with worry. Is it the dentist? Is it the daughter's distress? Is it death? Come to bed. Open any page of Emily Dickinson and have the top of your head taken off. No one saying, come to bed. At dinner, they all laughed and laughed and the next day, she couldn't remember what had been so funny. Taste this. A final turn off notice is in effect. At lunch, one of the people returns the bill to the small tray. We each owe $85, she announces. You figure about 20 more good years. What's going on with this cold, with this heat, with this rain? He slept on his side near to the bank vent, or was it a she? I was choking with rage and at the end of the plank where my grief walked, I finally stepped off and the weeping stopped. All was calm. I was blank and numb. The cool air at night. Lucky to be alive, a miracle to be alive. Beethoven getting loud, Beethoven getting, getting soft. Women writers without children, many. Women writers with children, few. Use of the drug was up 33% in the last six months. My friend says, Vibrationally, I think it's easier to move forward if we stick to the truth. No need to make anything up. Another loss, we'll lose again. Each time you feel it more, each time you feel it less. Of the billions of creatures alive today and of the billions of creatures who have lived, not one has come up with an adequate explanation of why we are here. I watch my daughter dance with a frown on her face and a warm feeling washes my chest. On her deathbed, she said in a shaky voice, we had a good time, didn't we? The pipes are shot. Another story will come. See above. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Our next speaker is Kirsten Valdez Quaid. Kirsten Valdez Quaid is the author of Night at the Fiestas, which won the John Leonard Prize from the National Book Critics Circle, the Sue Kaufman Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and a five under 35 award from the National Book Foundation. Kirsten was awarded a Rome Prize, a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, and a Stegner Fellowship. 
Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Best American Short Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, and elsewhere. She is an assistant professor at Princeton. Her new novel is The Five Wounds, and it was published in January of this year. Please welcome to the screen, Kirsten Valdez Quaid. Let me find you, Kirsten. There you are. Thank you, Alice. Um, what a treat to be back on Write America and to be reading with um, two writers I just admire enormously. That was a beautiful story, Susan. Um, Monkeys was one of those books that I read when I was first taking seriously my ambition to be a writer. And there's so many scenes in there that I, I still think about. Um, and that when I read them made me think that's the kind of story I wanna write. Um, so this is really exciting. I'm going to be reading um, a short scene from um, my novel, The Five Wounds, um, which came out um, last year, about a year ago. Um, it takes place in a small town in northern New Mexico, and um, the, it follows Amadeo Padilla, who's sort of a, he's an alcoholic, he's unemployed, um, and he's is strange from his teenage daughter, Angel. And um, when the story opens, he's been chosen to play the role of Jesus in the village's Good Friday procession. And in his attempt to do the best possible performance and change his life, he asks that actual nails be used. And his daughter, Angel, who is very pregnant, um, witnesses it and <clears throat> is really upset with him. So this scene takes place right after this, this crucifixion. And um, he and Angel are in the waiting room of the ER. In the crowded ER waiting room at Española Valley Regional Hospital, Angel sits beside him in cold silence, flipping angrily through a ragged parenting magazine while Amadeo cradles his hands in his lap, marveling at the bright stickiness of his own blood soaking the towels. The doctors are taking forever. He's been sitting under the fluorescent lights in this plastic chair bolted to the floor, leaning forward so as to protect his scourged tender back for nearly two hours. Through the automatic doors, the sky is already pink. Hey, he tells a nurse rushing past in scrubs printed with Easter eggs. How long is it going to be? Because this is really serious. He indicates his hands, but the nurse rushes on with only the barest tightening flicker around her mouth consulting her clipboard. Most of these people don't even seem sick. Not a single other person is losing blood. Where are the gunshot wounds, the heart attacks, the massive head injuries? Where is the carnage? Would someone please show him a single emergency greater than his own that might explain this unconscionable weight? He is Jesus for Christ's sake. Whoa, he tells Angel, I'm feeling really lightheaded, but she doesn't even glance at him. Across from them, a woman scrolls through her phone. Her young daughter, seven, eight, swings her feet restlessly and a rhinestone studded flip-flop drops to the teal epoxy floor. With both hands, she grips a bag of cherry cough drops. Her eyes are wide and fixed on his bloody towel. Are you sick? He asks the girl as nicely as he can, trying to rein in his annoyance. The girl raises her eyes from the gore in his lap with some reluctance. Her hair is ratty and she wears a pilled yellow pajama top. I might have foot and mouth disease, she says. The mother looks up warily from her phone. Maybe I could go before you then? Amadeo raises his swaddled hand, shrugging regretfully. I'm bleeding out. We've been here three hours, the woman says, voice flat, and she returns to her phone. You are not bleeding out, says Angel, louder and meaner than necessary. But what does she know? Angel is a high school dropout, not a doctor. People die from all the time from slit wrists, and the palm is basically the wrist. He moves in his chair and gasps when the bandage on his back shifts. After the second nail, the hermanos helped him write down and gave him water, offering their congratulations. Al Martinez had bandaged him up gently. Keep pressure here and here, he said, his voice low. You did good, son. Still, the man is no professional, and Amadeo can already feel the medical tape coming unstuck. To Amadeo's surprise, Tio Tive didn't show any of the kindness of the other hermanos, didn't even seem proud. 
And the old man didn't call him an ambulance either, just got one of the guys who lives in Española to drop them at the hospital. Nail gun, Diotive warned. You got in the way of a nail gun. Anyway, says Angel, turning the page of her magazine, it would serve you right if you did bleed out. He looks at her disbelieving. Hey, come on, what a thing to say. Where did that come from? All of a sudden, he remembers that today is Angel's birthday, 16. She didn't mention anything this morning. He wonders if she forgot herself or if she wanted the day to be his. Listen, Angel, I'm sorry you had to be in the emergency room on your birthday. I apologize, is that your problem? Is that what's bugging you, that you're not getting the attention? Listen, I wouldn't have asked you to come if it wasn't an emergency. I'm wounded. Angel says nothing. Thank God she'll have the baby soon, Amadeo thinks, because he's not sure how much more he can take of these moods. Did you see the whole thing, he asks in an undertone. He wishes he'd had her take pictures, but he reflects that wouldn't have been in the spirit of the occasion. Still, he wishes there was a record of his success. Angel riffles through the magazine too fast to be reading anything. Amadeo watches the article titles as she flips past. Oral fixation, take along snacks your child will love. Milking it, your toddler and lactose. I feel you, raising empathetic children. Amadeo taps this last article, and Angel pauses her frenetic page turning. Hey, that one looks good. Wish I'd known about raising empathetic children. Angel gives him a shriveling, disgusted look. You got to be joking me. He turns away from her and looks instead at the television mounted in the corner. Cable news plays too loud. A cruise ship has lost power and is floating free in the Caribbean. The toilets have flooded and the king shrimp have gone off. Big deal, thinks Amadeo, so they get a longer cruise, so they eat Fritos. It's not like they're facing a medical situation. It's not like there's blood involved. Amadeo hurts much worse than after the cutting of the seos on Ash Wednesday, worse than after those lashes. Earlier, on Calvario, he seemed to have risen to some heightened space that pain didn't penetrate. He was cloaked in grace, he supposes. But now he really, truly hurts. An angel is giving him neither the praise nor the sympathy he deserves. The pain clusters in his palms, shimmering, ever-changing. The blood is messy, coagulating, thick and black, ruining his white pants. He wants, suddenly, to put his daughter in her place. Don't you even got a boyfriend? Angel turns and looks at him like he's stupid. What do you think? Didn't your mom never teach you not to sleep around? All of the girls in my parenting class, not one of them has a guy that matters. Not one. You think you mattered? You shouldn't have come, he says. You think you have a right to just barge into my house and make yourself at home. Angel's eyes widen, and then she narrows them. It's my grandmother's house. You don't have a house. She turns back to her magazine, resolute. At long last, the girl and her mother are called. Amadeo looks at them piteously, and the girl looks back at him with interest, but the mother gathers their things and walks away, refusing eye contact. Hey, he says, ready to reconcile. Why are you so mad at me? I did good today. Angel finally sets the magazine on her lap and turns to him. So, she says deliberately, tell me, what was that? You never said anything about actual nails. You never said anything about actually getting crucified. What good is that to anyone? Her words are like a slap. What's it to you, Angel? Her voice thickens and lowers. In three weeks, I'm due. Three fucking weeks. She swallows and turns away, and her eyes rest unseeing on the television. For a moment, Amadeo thinks Angel is going to cry. When she turns back, however, her eyes are dry, her face splotchy, gaze shuddered. Very quietly, so quietly he has to lean toward her to hear, Angel says, how are you going to hold the baby? Or didn't you even think of that? Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Our next speaker is David Remnick. David Remnick is a reporter, was a reporter for the Washington Post for 10 years, including four in Moscow. He joined The New Yorker as a writer in 1992 and has been the magazine's editor since 1998. His previous book, King of the World, a biography of Muhammad Ali, was selected by Time as the top nonfiction book of the year. Lenin's Tomb, The Last Days of the Soviet Empire, won a Pulitzer Prize. 
a New York Times new and noteworthy book, The Fragile Earth Writing from the New Yorker on Climate Change, was published in November of 2021. Please welcome to the screen, David Remnick. Glad to hear David, there you go. Okay. Um, following Kirsten and Susan, mine is a, is a terrible idea. Those were beautiful passages and now you're stuck with a journalist and um, which is like having two gourmet meals and now some mealy cardboard, but I'll do my best. I, it's just a, an opening to one article and a closing to another. This is a piece about my former boss in another life, Catherine Graham. In my boyhood as a reporter, I nearly killed the matriarch of the liberal media conspiracy. This was in 1988, and I had recently been assigned to the Washington Post Moscow Bureau. In an otherwise blissful spring of journalistic overload, a time when the merest cough in the Kremlin merited front page attention, it came about that the Post and its sister publication Newsweek were being awarded a plum, an interview with the General Secretary of the Communist Party. Catherine Graham, the general secretary of the Washington Post Company, and a plane load of senior editors would soon arrive in town to conduct it. This was not entirely to the good. Great risk was involved, or someone had heard. Mrs. Graham, one always referred to her as Mrs. Graham, even in private and at great distances. Mrs. Graham did not travel in the style of the British Raj, but she was not arriving on a Eurail pass either. Attention would have to be paid. The cost of failure was incalculable. The legends of correspondence and their varying abilities to cope with a royal visit were countless. There was the Latin American correspondent for the Post who wandered the continent for weeks in advance, arranging hotel suites, hairdressers, and interviews with heads of state from Caracas to Tierra del Fuego. He was quite a success. But there was also a certain Africa-based correspondent, Kenya-based correspondent, who arrived, who carved his own career coffin by arranging for a balloon safari over the Maasai Mara at dawn. And just as the sun was glistening off the savannah and the balloon was rising above a herd of grazing giraffes, Mrs. Graham is said to have turned to the correspondent and announced with a profane burr, you know, I didn't travel all the way here to be a fucking tourist. It is said that the correspondent ended up as a recipe checker in the food, in the food section. And perhaps it was true. We in Moscow had neither the time nor the luxury that would allow us to confirm these legends. And one does not want to spend the, the remainder of one's career taste testing lima beans. As is true of any royal visit, there were many logistical problems to be worked out. As the junior man in the bureau, I was given the task of finding the hairdresser. I would not insist that Moscow was short on luxury in those days, except to note that I did not so much find a hairdresser as invent one. At one of the embassies, I found a young woman who was said to own a blow dryer and a brush, and I rang her up, explained the situation. Gravely, as if we were negotiating the Treaty of Ghent, I gave her an annotated copy of Vogue, a mugshot of Mrs. Graham, and $100. You're on, she said. This was certainly my most contribu important contribution to the interview with the General Secretary of the Co Communist Party. On the appointed day, I put on my good blue suit, fired up the office Volvo, and proudly drove the hairdresser to Mrs. Graham's suite at the National Hotel. Apparently, the interview went very well. Um, it was featured with a photograph in the next day's edition of Pravda. Mrs. Graham looked quite handsome, I thought, a nice full head of hair and well combed. I felt close to history. A few days later, I was assigned to show her and her close friend Meg Greenfield, the Post editorial page editor, around the city that was then known as Leningrad. Following the lead of my successful colleague, the Latin American correspondent, I tried to schedule every minute of the two days allotted to me. The first night's entertainment was an easy choice, the Kirov Ballet. For the second, I went with the upbeat down market option, the circus. Mrs. Graham seemed not to mind the nasty ventures of the almost very funny clowns. She was in a good mood. The interview had been heady stuff. The general secretary had, quote, revealed his plans for a joint United States-Soviet space mission to Mars, and we led the paper with that world beat. At one point, Mrs. Graham asked for ice cream. I got it for her. But then at intermission, she seemed to tire. As enormous cages and nets were being assembled in the circus ring, she declared, 
I think it's time to go. I panicked. My limousine driver had been given strict instructions and a sizable bribe to wait outside in case of emergency. This being Russia, however, I could not bet with any confidence against the possibility that he was at this very moment converting his cash into a refreshing liquidity at some local bar. Sure, we can go, I ventured, but the second act has some really great animals. I began to describe Misha the bear who wore skates on his hind paws and played ice hockey. Mrs. Graham blinked and said, I think it's time to go. As I began to lead the way down the steps, a bus-sized babushka, the usher, fixed me with a hard look and said, Nilzia, impossible, you can't go. It's not usually advisable or possible to argue with a Soviet bus, but my priorities were clear. I had visions of that fellow in the balloon high above the plane, floating into journalistic obscurity. So I did what one cannot ordinarily do with a babushka. I insisted. Then I lied. I told her that this woman, this very important woman, was gravely ill and in need of immediate medical attention. The babushka melted. But hurry, she said in Russian. All around was the loud mewing of big cats and small children. With me in the lead, the three of us walked down a ramp and passed what appeared to be a coffin-sized box with open slats. I passed the box without incident. So did Meg Greenfield. Then Mrs. Graham started past it. Suddenly, an enormous claw lunged out of the box and toward the innocent calf of the chairman of the Washington Post Company. To this day, I cannot say what the beast was, a leopard, a cougar, a jaguar, but I can still see its talons, not an inch from the hose and the flesh of my proprietor. She too saw it, felt its heat, and began running for the exit. The car at least was waiting and its driver was sober, but what of it? I would surely be recalled to the home office and I would be lucky to cover high school softball in Prince William County. But then Mrs. Graham was laughing. She was flushed, delighted. My God, she said, covering her pearls with the tips of her fingers. That was some circus. I almost rather died. This is a, an ending to a story, a profile of um, somebody I admired greatly, Leonard Cohen, um, singer, poet, composer, performer, um, Talmudist. And when I went to see Leonard Cohen, he was he was dying. And the usually in a profile form, you go and do things with the subject. You <laughs> go shopping, you go traveling, you do what they're doing, you watch them create. There was none of that with Leonard. Um, it was just a couple of days of sitting in his living room uh, while he talked. And he had, at that point probably weighed 95 pounds if, at, at most. He, was, he would have been, he died within a couple of months after I wrote this. So there's probably no more touring ahead. What's on Cohen's mind now is family, friends, and the work ahead. I've had family to support, so there's no sense of virtue attached to it, he said. I've never sold widely enough to be able to relax about money. I had two kids and their mother to support in my own life, and there was never an option of cutting out. Now it's a habit. And there's the element of time, which is powerful with this incentive to finish up. And I haven't gotten near finishing up. I've finished up a few things. I don't know how many other things I'll be able to get to because at this particular stage, I experience deep fatigue. There are times when I just have to lie down. I can't play anymore and my back goes fast too. Spiritual things, Baruch Hashem, thank God, have fallen into place for which I'm deeply grateful. Cohen has unpublished poems to arrange, unfinished lyrics to finish and record or publish. He's considering doing a book of poems in which, like pages of the Talmud, they're surrounded by pa passages of interpretation. The big change is the proximity to death, he said. I am a tiny, I, I'm a tidy kind of guy. I like to tie up the strings if I can. If I can't also, that's okay, but my natural thrust is to finish things that I've begun. Cohen said that he had a sweet little song that he'd been working through, one of many, and suddenly he closed his eyes and began reciting the lyrics. Listen to the hummingbird whose wings you cannot see. Listen to the hummingbird. Don't listen to me. Listen to the, to the butterfly whose days but number three. Listen to the butterfly. Don't listen to me. 
Listen to the mind of God, which doesn't need to be. Listen to the mind of God. Don't listen to me. He opened his eyes, paused a while, and he said, I don't think I'll be able to finish those songs. Maybe, who knows, and maybe I'll get a second wind. I don't know. But I don't dare attach myself to spiritual strategy. I don't dare to do that. I've got some work to do. Take care of business. I am ready to die. I just hope it's not too uncomfortable. Cohen's hand had been bothering him, so he plays the guitar less than he did. But he was eager to show me his synthesizer, and he set about playing a chord progression in one hand. In his chair, he waved away any sense of what might follow death. That was beyond his understanding and his language. I don't ask for information that I probably wouldn't be able to process, even if it were granted to me, he said. Persistence, living to the last, loose ends, work, that was the thing. A song from four years ago, Going Home, made clear his sense of limits. He will speak these words of wisdom like a sage, a man of vision, though he knows he's really nothing but the brief elaboration of a tube. The new record opens with the title track, You Want It Darker, and in the chorus, the singer declares, Hineni, Hineni, I'm ready, my Lord. Hineni is Hebrew for here I am, Abraham's answer to the summons of God to sacrifice his Isaac, his son. The song is clearly an announcement of readiness, a man at the end preparing for his service and devotion. And yet the man is sitting in his medical chair was anything but haunted or defeated. I know there's a spiritual aspect to everybody's life, whether they want to cop to it or not, Cohen said. It's there, you can feel it in people. There's some recognition that there's a reality that they cannot penetrate, but which influences their mood and their activity. So that's operating now. That activity at a certain point of day or night insists on a certain kind of response. Sometimes it's just like, you're losing too much weight, Leonard. You're dying, but you don't have to cooperate enthusiastically with the process force yourself to have a sandwich. What I mean to say is that you hear the bot call, the divine voice. You hear this other deep reality singing to you all the time. And much of the time you can't decipher it. Even when I was healthy, I was sensitive to the process. At this stage of the game, I hear it saying, Leonard, just get on with the things you have to do. It's very compassionate at this stage. More than at any time of my life, I no longer have that voice that says, you're fucking up. And that's a tremendous blessing, really. Thanks. Thanks so much. Wow. So that was beautiful. Well, it's all Leonard. <laughs> what about it's the passage of journalism. You take somebody else's words and put it down. So good. I I love that. I love um, that blink in the Catherine Graham piece. <laughs> <laughs> that, was so that was the worst part. I'm leaving the Washington Post. Bye bye. <laughs> well, it's too bad, David. You couldn't hear the laughter of people because it really is. There are a lot of laughs in that. It's very, very mm -hmm. funny. It's true. So how, how has it been? Can I ask you two who write such an incredible fiction? Is, is a writer's life, which is often so isolated as it is, what is it any different in the pandemic than it is as we emerge from it? I mean, go ahead, Kirsten. You seem to. You. <laughs> Well, you know, some some of life feels normal again. I'm, you know, back to teaching in person and that, that aspect um, does. But I would say that the the isolation wasn't the hard part of the pandemic for me. I mean, that um, I, I was OK with with most of it, not all of it, but <laughs> but most of it. I mean, there were there were other really hard parts, you know, losses, um, but yeah. How about for you, Susan? Well, you know, I, I think at the beginning it was, it was, oh, good. The world's going to die. I mean, one part of it, the world's now going to operate so that I can be isolated without having to sort of organize it. Right. So at, at the beginning, it was, it was this relief. You know, it was a relief, partly as a writer, 
I think was a relief as a human being in terms of more kind of interaction than maybe you wanted all the time. And, and I, I think as a writer, you know, we, we know when, when there are joys in solitude, what they are and to, to sort of have your life being steered a little bit back toward that, that was, that was good. And yeah. I didn't find it hard to work. I know a lot of people did. Um, I, I feel like everything changed, but things were still as, you know, the life is dire for people somewhere always. <laughs> so it, it didn't seem, you know, it was, it just started being logistical things that were so different. Right. Yeah. And, and, for the first, you know, couple of years, <laughs> it it was just kind of a change. And then, I don't know, again, this is more of a social thing than a writerly thing, but so who am I to, you know, I can talk about being a writer. I'm not a spokesperson for <laughs> anything more than that. But I think venturing back into the world and realizing, oh, those interactions, which I thought were taking, draining my energy or that weren't just with the intimate people you knew or were, were actually an important part of what we need, mm -hmm. you know, not have everything be direct and knowing everyone that you come in contact with. And just even the, you know, from the slight person that you see and interact with to the sort of friend sometime to the person that you're buying your milk from and stuff, you started to feel, I started to feel the loss of, of that. Mm. It gets you somewhere, you know, it's, it's strange, but it took a while before it caught up with me. Yeah. But, yeah. and, and that has a deep kind of sadness to it to not have that. Well, I, for, 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 I have, you know, I, I don't have a writer's life, right? I don't, um, I don't write very much, and I do it as on the on, on the side, like some people play golf or shoot ski or take a walk. It's it, to me, it's this uh, other activity. Yeah, but that that's true with us sometimes too. It's, yeah. it's all other thing on the side. Um, and. So I, I, I have a, a, you know, a workplace and on one fine day, everybody left for this on the subway and we didn't see each other again for two years and, and change and navigating that well, you know, at home, um, I have a complicated home life. I have a, three kids and one of them is still here as a 22 year old woman. Um, who's profoundly autistic, I mean, really profoundly so. So she's at home, my wife's at home, so we're all at home together all day long and running the New Yorker out of a little, you know, upstairs uh, office. Uh, it was uh, confusing and I, and I think, or, and difficult in, in many ways, but not as difficult as being a nurse or a doctor or a, a brother's emergency room doctor. But it was, it, what's been profound now that we're, somewhat back in the office, somewhat seeing each other bit by bit is to see the toll, the level of um, exhaustion, um, people's difficulties, you know, leave it at that. Um, it, it's, 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 it, and just, just knowing that that's a universal and that we're the lucky ones in this whole equation, preposterously lucky, uh, it's, um, amidst all the other historical things one's living through um, in this period of time. It's um, a profound thing, a profound thing. You see any, um, since you're, you know, you you get to sort of observe more, do you see it, I mean, obviously the toll of what people go through, but what do you think the kind of after effect is that I mean on a very trivial level I find that when I do see people I start talking too much like I've, I've lost <laughs> <my> social <laughs> rhythm got all off you know yeah. but on a, another kind of
kind of psychological level, I mean, it it must be some, you know, something that the people got out of practice with and what effect mm -hmm. does that have and on their relationships and, you know, it's, I mean, I guess we, it's hard to tell, but is there anything you've... Uh, it was really, it was, uh, and I don't know how Kirsten feels about this, but I it was an increasingly difficult thing to get on a Zoom call, which is one mode of existence with 15 you know, people in the checking department say, these are all young people who came to New York because they wanted to work at an interesting place and go out at night and meet people and serve a kind of apprenticeship so they could become the people they wanted to be, whether they wanted to be Susan Minot or Kirsten or whom they wanted to be other things and also have a good time and live their young yeah, yeah. lives. And then suddenly they're in a, um, a studio apartment and all those things are taken away from them. And, um, you know, uh, George Floyd is happening and you feel politics even more intensely before, than before, perhaps. And Trump hasn't gone away in January 6th and, 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 and. And I, I think, um, I, I, you know, the toll was, I, I can see it, it's evident. It was evident in every Zoom call, those faces. I don't know, Kirsten, was, 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 do, were you affected by this? I certainly saw that in the classroom. I mean, even even this year where things were, you know, we were sort of working our way back to normal. Oh, you're back. Um, yeah. And I, I think there is, I, I see exactly what you're talking about, this level of exhaustion. And um, I, you know, I think, I think a lot of my students, you know, were really suffering. Um, even even though everyone's back on campus and, and things are more normal. Um, I do think one of the sort of lovely changes that I've noticed is that um, I see it among my colleagues and also with my students, but I think they're, they're, people talk about their, what's going on in their lives in a way that um, I, I didn't see as much before the pandemic. Um, I think they're, Maybe because we were probably because we were all, you know, moving in our living rooms for so long, um, that there, th that that sort of boundary um, became a little bit more permeable in a in a really lovely way. Um, well, we got to meet people's cats, and the dogs are coming, and the thing, you know, you 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 did see people in there where they were. That was. That that was strangely intimate, David. Yeah. It's not the same kind of right. the old sort of way of mixing, but yeah, I, I think that's. It was interesting to, to to note that everyone in America had a copy of *The Power Broker* by Robert Caro behind their shoulder every time. <laughs> not me. Bob Caro must have been incredibly happy. <laughs> incredibly happy. <laughs> the curation of your, you know, it's it's, it's <laughs> like the records one would spread around when, God willing, a girl would come to your door room and Bob Carroll became like the John Coltrane of, <laughs> of, of books. <laughs> um, can I just ask you about, because Leonard Cohen is one of my, you know, top of the, top of the heap heroes. Yeah. And when you wrote that piece, did you have, I mean, I just would like to know everything he says. <laughs> did, did you need to? You well, know. I, it's the most terrifying thing. I'm, I'm, so I know I, I met him because I, I have a friend who teaches English at Claremont McKenna, you know, one of those five schools in LA. Yes. And Bob at that time lived at the foot of Mount Baldy. And on Mount Baldy was a Zen monastery. Hold that in your head. Bob was at a 7-Eleven or some kind of convenience store at one o'clock in the morning buying donuts for the reason that people buy donuts at one o'clock in the morning because he was incredibly stoned and he was hungry. And he looked down the aisle and there was this man with a sh with shaved head and, and Buddhist Zen Buddhist robes buying, you know, Eskimo pies or, or you know, ice cream, the same, and was in the same condition. 
and Bob walked up and said, you look a lot like Leonard Cohen. And he said, I can't do the deep voice. He said, I am Leonard Cohen. They sat in Bob's car smoking even more, uh, some giant uh, joint and eating donuts and eating ice cream. And they became fast friends. And Fagan, Bob Fagan is his name, um, a really good scholar. And he um, at one point asked me if I wanted to meet him. And, and I, of course, and I was in Los Angeles. And then I asked if I could, you know, interview him. And by this time he was dying. And I, you know, um, I, I've never heard anyone talk with the same f emotional uh, fluency mm -hmm. as this guy. And yes, I mean, that, I mean that's the thing. Whenever you see an interview with him, and oh you think all those, all those hours he spent silently meditating when he could have been talking, and we could have heard more from him. You know, it seems. Well, I, think, I think the quite ironic. Was pretty good. Was pretty good. Yeah. And he was funny about certain subjects, like you know, hip hop. He he, he clearly didn't know a hell of a lot, but he, he, so he did a twenty-minute riff on Kanye West, um, good, bad, and indifferent. He was but quite knowledgeable. He was he was a re truly deeply literate um, man and a, and a spiritual person in a way that's hard for me to understand because I'm not. And um, I, I just, and he died the day Trump won, which is a piece of exquisite uh, justice and timing, at least for him, if not for the rest of us, if not for the rest of us. Kirsten, do you, do you, if, if you, is, is Leonard Cohen appealing to you in, in any way? Oh, very. Yeah. No, I, I just remember, um, you know, when, when that news came through and just feeling yeah. like it was just injustice upon injustice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, or, it's, been a, it's been a good time for that. <laughs> it's been a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nell Painter wrote in the in the chat the funniest comment I see. David's Cohen piece goes into my old studies syllabus. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. high, high praise from somebody I, I admire enormously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kristen, would you, was your rhythm of writing was your it, has that been affected by these kind of last couple of years? Oh, and is, I mean, absolutely. Do, do I would for writers to admit that they got more done. I mean, I I know a lot of those writers. I um I was not one sadly. I um I found it very difficult to write. Um you know, particularly particularly in the beginning. Um those those early surreal months. Um yeah. I I found it difficult to read and it was the first time in my life I haven't been able to read. And that was profoundly unsettling. Um, right. I'd, I'd start a paragraph and just, you know, my, my mind would be gone. I think every, everyone seemed to have that. I, I found that I ran out of steam after a while writing. And so I switched to, um, I paint also and, <laughs> Um, and I started making collages, which somehow fit the pandemic, like you say, how surreal it was. And I was doing, I was living on an island in Maine. And so I was doing, um, you know, taking pictures of the landscape I was in. And then I'd do collages because I didn't have my New York Times anymore because I was way too far away, which usually I cut out. I'd make my own images of like the 30s and 40s movies I was watching and take pictures. Mm -hmm put the people on to, so I was like creating these other alternate like worlds of fragments that were, <laughs> wow. Wow. never would have done that otherwise because I would have been too busy doing. So I think Alice asked us that we should ask each other what we're reading. I think mm. that was, man, am I, am I correct? Look, I think she's coming. There you, see, I, I am. That's that? usually the last question of the evening. So I have a couple of others. Go, go ahead. Um, one of the things that I sort of dipped a toe in earlier is, do you have, um, what emerging author do you think we might have missed that you think we should know about? And this is your opportunity to shout out a former student that might have gotten published or anybody that you know, you know, just if you have it, David, you may be least likely to know somebody, but 
you never know. So I figured I'd throw that one out there so that we could give a shout out to some emerging talent. Well, I have a, a student who's her, her first novel is coming out in June. So you can, you can keep a lookout for her. Her name is Alison Fairbrother and the novel is Oh, yes. And it's excellent. Really good. I'm not Thank answering you. that question for all the money in the world because I have a certain job. <laughs> if I say the name, I'm in trouble. And if I don't say that, I'm in trouble. Why don't you ask me which of my three children I like best? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Easy. Easy. <laughs> That'll work for you. Just, a, just as a side note, Allison Fairbrother is going to be on Right America on the 27th of June. There you go. So... Good call on that one. So she'll get. So you all tune into their episode. <laughs> Kirsten, did you have anybody you wanted to share with us? Yeah, I mean, a book that I'm really looking forward to is um, by a friend of mine. It's a collection of stories coming out in June. Um, Rainbow, Rainbow by Lydia Conklin. And um, it's, I haven't read all of them, but the ones I have read are just, wonderful they're hilarious and um dark and it's, it's i'm really really looking forward to that book is the is the title from the elizabeth bishop poem by any chance i don't think it is i don't um i could be wrong but i don't think so um it it follows um a lot of um queer and trans characters and um, the, it's, um yeah, it's. I'll look, I'll look out for it. Yeah, I, I love hearing about things I haven't heard of. It's it 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 makes me very curious to go and find it. Um, I'd just like to follow up on one of the things that you all said earlier about. Uh, David asked a question as to whether it was easier or more difficult to write. I'm fine. I found in bookstore world that for some people it was easier or more difficult to read, and I think Susan touched on that really briefly. I think that the rhythm, there were really, it was distinctly two different types of people. People came in, read voraciously, and then within that subset of people reading, some of them wanted to read everything about pandemics like Station Eleven and books like that, and other people just said anything but, anything but. But I did find in the very early stages of the pandemic, a lot of people reading about World War II because it was the last time it was a terrible adversity where the good guys won <laughs> so in the middle of all of this i found it selling a lot of either history or world war ii historical fiction so i just sort of, sort of passed it on there may, must have been some kind of disturbance in the force that we all picked up on that's I also, I also listened to a lot of books and that was something that i had you know been very reluctant to do and I thought, well, I'll just do it while I'm riding my bike or something. I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it with books maybe I've read already. Like I'll listen to a Dickens that I know and da, da, da. like, so it won't be the first time I'm meeting a book and, you know, give it the attention. And, and, and then it was so um, satisfying that, and because I was spending so much time alone that if I wasn't reading or writing, I was listening to something. So I listened to a lot of books that way. And I, I felt um, instead of feeling guilty about it, I thought, well, back to the, the earliest, you know, way of, of, of telling and, and receiving stories was the oral tradition. So, so it, I was going back to my roots as a, as a story listener. And that's been great because you can read and, and the, I, I, I was one of those people that was reading some of the World War II, um, but but non nonfiction, and also, you know, Everest stories of climbing Everest or Ernest Shackleton and explorers. Those the, the really extreme adventure stories were very good to read because you felt like, okay, this is is so gripping, and it's not my eyeball being popped out by a book in the tent. So. <laughs> Kirsten, were you going to add to that? Oh, you know what? I I 
started by saying that I had so much trouble reading in the beginning. Um, what what brought me back to reading was poetry. I I read so much poetry um, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and um, that was wonderful because I I you know in I dabble when <laughs> in reading poetry in regular life, but mostly I read fiction and, and nonfiction. I found poetry creeping toward the mainstream during the whole pandemic, which I found such a delight. It was just, it was wonderful. It was just, it was a delight. David, did you notice any kind of trends within your culture as to difficulty writing or trouble with, I mean, other than the circumstances of being in a bed, running the world from a bedroom, you know, kind of feeling. It's my, it's my job, never well fulfilled, um, to um, urge people to write more, better, faster. <laughs> um, you know, it, there's an urgency to a, a journalistic enterprise um, it's mainly a journalistic enterprise because the stories come when they come. And Deborah Treisman, and who the person knows well, uh, our fiction editor, um, those stories happen when they happen, and we get uh, an enormous number of them. And thankfully, we're very honored, privileged to get them. The journalism, um, you know, is is another matter, and um, so <laughs> it's a very delicate dance for an editor urging people to, you know, we need this, there's this deadline and all that. There's a kind of, um, uh, um, it, 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 it can't always be gentle, but it can't be uh, overbearing, other, otherwise the work doesn't come. But you have to come out every day and now every week and, and so on. Um, and as far as reading is concerned, I, I can't listen to books because that leads to sleep, which I object to. And uh, the concept of sleep is the most offensive thing to me. It's right up there with death. Um, but I, lately, I, you know, it's not new for me, but lately I've been reading more Russian things. And there's a short story writer that, if you haven't read, I could, um, it's right over there, or Varlam Shalamov. Uh, Shalamov was a great writer of the of the camps. He wrote a, 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 there's a short collection called Kalima Stories, Kalima's in the Far East, where the uh, gulag camps were for mining gold and, and, and so on. And Shalamov, um, many more stories were discovered later. He was a hero of Solzhenitsyn's and uh, Brodsky and any number of other writers. So that's, that's one thing. And I, I, I'd really recommend, because it's right here, it, don't drop it on your foot, it will break your foot. Um, it's Stephen Kotkin's um, uh, multi-volume biography of, of Stalin. Um, it, it's the most extraordinary work on that figure that I know of. Um, you, know, you want to block out a little time for it, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> immense, but uh, a very a, a deep biography, and there's one more volume to go. This takes you into the war, um, and considering what we're thinking about all the time now and reading about in Ukraine, um, it has its relevance. I actually was gonna ask that question of you, so thank you for volunteering that. Um, on a lighter note, yeah. since I am a bookstore and we are winding down the hour, I must ask you what you are reading. What's on your nightstand? Oh, hey, have to ask, I mean, look behind me. I have books. <laughs> um, I'm rereading, rereading something, a Black Boy, Richard Ross. Oh, got it. Yeah. Um, I, I read a lot of things at the same time. And one is, uh, he's, he's, he's long gone from us, but Stefan Zweig's novellas are just transporting and beautiful and fantastic. What's the chess one that I read? It's so good. Is it um, the Royal Game. Oh, boy, Zachary. Exactly. Really love that. So good, but there's also, um, you know, the secret and fear, and you know, they're really letter from an unknown woman. They're really excellent. They made a movie out of that. Um, and then I just that these are recent books in sort of the last year. They're they're all by masterful women, um, and 
they're as good as anything they've written before. And one is Claire Keegan, Irish hmm. writer, called These Small Things. Which I knew you were going to say that book. Absolutely gorgeous. That was a spectacular book. Yeah. And there was a lovely, she wrote a story recently in The New Yorker that was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the great Elizabeth Strout's most recent book, it's called Oh, William. And it's as good as anything she's written, if not um, first of all. It's fantastic. And um, I think it's just out now, Samantha Hunt. Um, it's a very unusual book called The Unwritten Book. And it's sort of essays combined with sort of thought pieces combined with a uh, literary analysis and and sort of examination of her background and it's she's anything by her is great awesome thank you for the list i'm, I'm writing while you all are talking kirsten what are you up to what are you reading oh i i mean i read these small things and oh william very recently too and both both such beautiful books um i i recently read brandon taylor's story collection filthy animals which I just is is brilliant and my God, I mean, can he write a sentence and just is so attuned to the inner lives of, of those characters. It's really beautiful. Um, and I just started Housemaid of Dawn. Um, so I'm I'm enjoying that and it's it's exciting to be, you know, coming to this <laughs> this book that everybody else has read. <laughs> Well, you'd be surprised. Anyway, um, I cannot thank the three of you enough. It has been a inspiring evening to be to hear your work and to hear your discussion. So I must sign off with each of you now, and I want to thank you, thank you thank each you. for a wonderful time and an inspired evening. Um, I want to thank Susan, Kirsten, and David for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you particularly to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We hope to see you all next Monday as we welcome Hel Helen Vedler and Leon Wies Wieseltier. And I'm sorry I mispronounced that name. Please remember to check out Bird's Books Write America page where you can sign up for upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. Thank you all and see you next week.